Okay, so we have uh, the lacing material, we have uh, a way to create population inversion. The next thing we need is we need an optical resonator or cavity. Basically, this is just an arrangement of mirrors that makes sure that light is bouncing back and forth and it goes through the active medium many times to exploit uh, population inversion. Uh, and each time the light goes through uh, the pumped medium, it will increase the energy of the beam passing through and uh, we have to, to keep up the stable, stable operation. We need this increase at every pass because through the outcoupler we lose uh, Uh, this is how mirrors look like uh, in the laser cavity. Uh, usually, they are the, the coating on a mirror is uh, depends upon what uh, wavelength the laser has. Uh, it can be metallic or it can be multi-layer dielectric mirrors that we use, and uh, it's always specific. The coating is always specific. Of Sometimes we use mirrors that one color goes through and the other is reflected or sometimes it's just out of the plane uh, of the system. Uh, sometimes lasers are used for spectroscopy and for spectroscopy you would really want to have a single color. You, you only want to uh, address one single transition in the system that you are studying. So, Having a laser which has an active medium and the two uh, end mirrors, it gives you a certain separation of frequency lines. This is what I told you at the beginning, that depending on the total length of the system, the, the separation between the lines is given by the speed of light divided by time twice uh, the distance between the two mirrors. And this is because you want to have, you, 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 you will uh, the uh, oscillator works in a way that uh, you produce standing waves in it. So if you fit an equal number, an integer number of wavelengths onto the distance, onto the length of the cavity, then the standing waves can uh, be produced or uh, maintained in, in the cavity. So this, the laser will give you, the oscillator will give you equal space lines in, uh, in, in frequency. Now, if you have a gain medium, the lazy medium, it usually has a certain bandwidth. So not all of these frequency components, but a few can be amplified in, in the laser. So your lazy medium and your oscillator will select a few frequency lines uh, that can uh, be maintained in the oscillator. But if you have an application for the lasers with only one single frequency component, then you have to add a, a further component, which is called the atalon. Uh, it makes a selection uh, of, uh, of the frequencies. You can see that where these three coincide, that's the only frequency component that will be amplified. So this is a, a special uh, application of lasers when you want to use it for spectroscopy and then you might want to add uh, an item as well. Uh, this is kind of a small uh, lettering in this figure. Are they going to get a copy of the slides? Or? Uh, so basically what I want to say is that this is the whole range of uh, electromagnetic waves that are addressed by lasers. So it goes from the ultraviolet to the far infrared. So uh, it goes from 100 nanometer up to 100 micrometer. And uh, across this range uh, you can make lasers at specific uh, parts of the spectrum. Probably not continuously, but uh, in each section you can find the material and active medium that would work. Uh, the longest wavelength uh, laser.
laser that I know is the CO2 laser at 10 micron. Uh, dye lasers usually cover the whole visible range. Uh, the lasers we are using in the lab are titanium sapphire laser. They are at uh, 800 nanometer, uh, around uh, 1 micron. There are a few uh, lasers, neodymium, uh, young neodymium glass. So these are all doped crystals. Uh, they produce uh, lights in the near infrared and uh, when the frequency is doubled, they, we get the green lights so of 1000 we uh, have the wavelengths to 500 nanometer and that's uh, what's often used in wavelength but I, later on I'm going to give you another table with medical, uh, concentrating on medical applications but uh, you may not be able to read all the different labels, but I, what I would like to point out is that uh, very different materials can be used to produce uh, lasers of uh, any wavelength range uh, you can see. Uh, and uh, in the title of my talk I, I said that I'm going to talk about short pulse laser. So there is another distinction between lasers, uh, continuous versus pulse mode, that I would like to shed some light on. So basically a continuous mode laser means that you turn it on and continuously light comes out uh, without much modulation. So when I turn on my pointer, this is continuous uh, radiation that you get. A pulse mode laser means that it's flashing, it goes on and on. And usually, when we talk about pulsed lasers, it's not this uh, type of uh, modulation that I can produce with, uh, with my fingers, or even not what I can produce electronically. Because when we want to build uh, a short pulse laser, then the pulse duration is usually in the picosecond or the femtosecond uh, range. Here I have an example, this now dimming young laser, this is one of the lasers that we use, this is the, that uh, you double the frequency to get the green light. And this produces uh, two joules of energy in each burst, and uh, the burst is 20 nanosecond long, so it's 20 times 10 to the minus 9 seconds, and it comes at 10 hertz repetition rate. So these are the main parameters of this laser. And you can see that for a 10 hertz laser that produces uh, 10 to the, the 8 second uh, pulses, there is a huge waiting time after each pulse compared to the pulse duration. So you have the light on for 10 to the minus 8 seconds and then you wait almost, uh, you, you wait 1.1 1, uh, 1 second. So uh, eight, a factor of 8 uh, 10 to the 8 uh, times longer, you wait between the two pulses than what you had in, uh, in the pulse. And uh, the main advantage of such lasers is that you concentrate the energy in these bursts. Uh, instead of providing it continuously, you just have the small bursts, but the power, energy divided by the time, can be really big. The way to do pulse laser is, you have to have not just one single frequency, but a combination of frequencies. If you think about a wave of two different frequencies that you uh, hear together, this is often done with the tuning fork, then you would start hearing an intensity fluctuation of uh, the sound. This is what we call in physics beating. So having two components gives you an amplitude model. And if you have more than uh, just uh, two frequency components, then uh, the time while the amplitude is considerable can be uh, really big. The more the number of uh, frequency components that you add together, the smaller pulse duration you can achieve. Uh, if we go back here, you can see actually that underneath the gain curve, so the number, the, the frequencies that can be amplified in an active medium, usually there are many frequency components. Uh, 
which are uh, sending waves of the cavity. So if you manage to combine these frequencies together, this is a way to go for short fast lasers. In this case, we wanted to get rid of them because we didn't want a short fast laser, but the spectroscopic laser. But this is usually how we go about when we want to produce a short fast laser. What we need for pulse operation of uh, the laser is a broadband lasing medium, and also you need to lock the phases of these components together. I'll just give you an example. Uh, if we have a lasing medium that contains uh, 16 frequency lines, and the, the 16 frequency components are in the same phase, not uh, delayed with respect to each other, then you can have such short bursts. But if you would have these 16 uh, components with random phase shifted, so you just have these sine functions and you add them up, but the phase of them, the way how they start, they don't always start at the zero, but they are shifted randomly, you would get such a structure, which is not short pulses, but looks like noise. So these are the things that you need for short pulse lasers, broadband amplifying medium, and uh, some way to lock the phases together. The way to lock the phases together can be done uh, via uh, a modulator which is outside the cavity or by a modulator inside the cavity, for example, uh, varying the losses of uh, the cycle in the uh, oscillator. Or actually, one other thing is you can modify temporally the pumping efficiency of the laser. This, these cases will all give you uh, short fast lasers. Uh, here I have a, a brief summary of how fast durations are getting shorter and shorter with time. You can see here that uh, since 1965, uh, the first laser was in 1960, that was already a fast laser. But in 1965, uh, the record of fast duration was a bit less than 10 picosecond. One picosecond is 10 to the minus 12 seconds. And now we are at a time where we, are, where we can produce laser pulses of a few femtoseconds. The femto is 10 to the minus uh, 15. And this is done by changing the uh, material, the laser material. So the first lasers, uh, pulse lasers were dye lasers. I don't know if you remember, but I told you dye lasers have a wide spectral range. They are tunable. Mm -hmm. Now this is a, another property that is also useful for short pulse durations because then you can have many uh, components uh, to sync together. Uh, but nowadays it's, it's the solid state uh, lasers that are uh, winning And Titan Zephyr is uh, the most common uh, lasing material for short fast lasers, and the world record I think is about 3.8 femtoseconds of uh, pulse duration that they can produce. And why do we want uh, short pulse duration? There are basically two reasons for short pulses. One is if you want to picture a fast process, because the way we picture fast process is that we flash light on the system and see what happens. And while you flash, flash the light, the shorter the flash, the more uh, you can resolve the temporal evolution of the system. Uh, so it is kind of analogous to this uh, flash uh, photography where you have the, uh, the camera open uh, continuously but you flash on the system a very short uh, light, the flash, and then you only collect light which comes from the system during that time, because uh, uh, when, the system, when your, uh, the system that you want to picture is not lit, then there is no light coming. So instead of uh, opening and closing the shutter, you keep it open and then you just uh, produce a flash to capture uh, steady moments of very fast, uh, evolving states. 
And uh, this type of photography you can do down to the microsecond regime and you can freeze the instant uh, of motion with this uh, flash photography. Uh, if you want to picture something which is even faster than this, uh, that in, in a mic microsecond that is uh, well over, then you need uh, lasers, uh, short pulse lasers. And the way how we can study really fast processes, processes appearing on the femtosecond uh, regime, is that we have a pump probe setup. We have actually two laser pulses that are delayed relative to each other. And the delay between the two is very easily and reproducibly varied. And what happens is we have the pump or clocking pulse that we send into the system and it initiates a process. And then we come with the second uh, pass at a given delay and see the optical properties of the system. And if we change the delay, we can see how the op optical properties of the system varies with time. And from this we can deduce uh, some information of what happened to the system. For example, if we have a huge protein and we uh, shine on it a very intense uh, pulse, first pulse, it can start uh, blowing it up to disintegrate. And with the second pulse that comes, we can probe, we can see what chemical bonds are still existent from the absorption spectrum. Or uh, we can uh, have uh, some X-ray diffraction pattern from the second uh, pulse to see what's at the average displacement in, in the system that we blew up with the, with the first uh, pulse. So basically this is one idea why we would want very short pulses. But if we want to study very quick processes uh, to be able to freeze the instance of uh, what's happening, we need very short pulses. The other uh, reason to have very short pulses is that as I said, in a short pulse, you concentrate the energy of the laser into a short time. So here I give you an example of, uh, this is now another laser, this is a Tyson laser, I believe, uh, that produces a certain energy pulses, usually of the order of uh, millijoule, and, uh, but the pulse duration is in the femtosecond regime, a few times 10 to the Seconds, and this laser is also a 10 hertz system, so the pulses come at 0.1 seconds uh, after each other. Uh, we can define the power of the system, which is energy divided by time, and depending on whether we just look during the burst or in average, we would talk about peak power or average power. I'll give you some numbers how different these are. And when we talk about the intensity of the laser pulse, then it's uh, the energy of the pulse divided by its duration and divided by the area where it is focused to. So basically this is the number that gives you how, how strong the field is uh, at a given point uh, for the interaction. So the, this is a pulse laser I'm talking about. I got the numbers uh, from from a laboratory uh, that they use this uh, types of laser for. So in each pulse, they have 35 millijoules of energy. The pulse duration is 20 femtosecond, and then we can calculate what's the peak power. So we just take the energy of one pulse and divide by the length of the pulse, and it gives you 10 to the 12 watts, which is a huge number, how huge it is. Uh, the nuclear power plant in Hungary is producing in four blocks together uh, 10 to the 9 watts. This is 10 to the 12 watts. So this is really huge. This is very concentrated uh, energy. So energy-wise, it's not too much, but it's very concentrated. Therefore, it has a very high peak power. But if we want to see what's the average power, we have to see that in each second we have 10 bursts. So each second the system gives out uh, 0.35 joules. So the average power is 0.35 watts. So this is a very low number. The light bulbs, uh, they consume some, uh, something around 100 watts, these watts that uh, we have up there. This is really uh, low. So 
So the reason why we want to make pulse lasers is because we want to have a very strong interaction available during the pulses, but we don't, we cannot actually, but we don't want to uh, have the laser consuming very much energy because this is not something that you just get out of nothing. You have to pump it into the system. So basically, the way I like to think about the pulse laser is that you pump continuously the energy into your laser system at an average rate of around a watt. And then the laser waits and it, it accumulates all the energy and then in a very short burst it gives out energy. And then again it accumulates the energy for a long time and then in a flash it gives out the energy. And the intensity of the reactions we can uh, feed with our lasers is, uh, co is uh, proportional to the peak power whereas the power consumption that the laser takes up is related to the average power. It's obviously not that because you use a lot of energy. This is not a highly efficient process. There is a lot of heat dissipated, but at least it's just because it's related to, to that amount. Uh, and uh, as I said, in a power plant you can achieve 10 to the 9 watts, but this is going on continuously not just for a few femtoseconds uh, each second, but this goes on continuously. Uh, in our laboratory, we can achieve uh, 10 to the 12 watts in the laser system, and when the ELI infrastructure, the super laser will be built, uh, then it can go up to 10 to the 18 watts. So this is very intense uh, interaction that will be allowed uh, between light and matter. Uh, I, I like to shed some light on how big this intensity is. I don't know who has done basic physics uh, at university, but basically light is an electromagnetic wave, so it, it is associated with some electric field. And uh, the electric field and the intensity of light is related through this equation. So when I say that I have a certain energy of a pulse in a certain duration and I focus it down to, let's say, 100, and, uh, 100 micron uh, diameter, then I can calculate how much is the intensity of the light. And the, for these uh, special numbers that uh, I gave here, it gives you 10 to the 16 watts per square centimeter. And then from this formula, you can calculate how much is the electric field strength in the focus of this uh, laser pulse. And then it turns out that uh, the electric field strength is 10 to the 11 volts per meter. This is quite a high number. If you calculate what's the Coulomb force on the electron uh, provided by the central ion, uh, typical numbers you put in uh, for the distance between the electron and the atom gives you again 10 to the 11 so the electric field we produce in this pulse laser is the same order of magnitude as the Coulomb uh, force, Coulomb field binding the electron in the atom. So what will happen if you shine your laser onto an atom? You would just tear off the electron. You just ionize, you just create plasma. So, and this is a moderate uh, pulse parameters that I have here. In a leading uh, research infrastructure, you would have much, uh, much higher rate. Uh, just a very simple example of what is uh, these uh, what these intensities correspond to. If you take all the sunlight that falls onto the Earth, so not all the light of the sun, just a small proportion that falls onto the Earth, and you uh, focus it down onto a palm, then you would get 10 to the 14 watts per cent watts per square centimeter. So you would need a magnifying glass, which is the same size as the cross section of the Earth you would get this amount of light. This is something we can produce routinely in, in any uh, science lab. But as I said, at uh, ELI, uh, there will be a much higher intensity of the pulses. We are thinking about going to 10 to the 20th watts per square centimeter. So basically, uh, at ELI, or uh, at the large-scale laser systems, the question is not, not, not what's going to happen if I shine my laser onto a system. 
that uh, the answer to that question is trivial, it will evaporate. The only question is how, and this is what we are going to use uh, these uh, super intense lasers for. Lasers come in different sizes and different shapes. I think I have uh, shown you some examples, a solid state laser, gas laser, diode laser, and this is again a laser system. Uh, this photo is from the National Ignition Facility in the US. They have a huge laser. Well, this is actually not one laser, but 192 laser beams are focused onto one target to uh, initiate uh, fusion. But I also have here uh, some more down-to-earth examples of lasers. These are the lasers more, most often used in medicine. Uh, so I uh, have here uh, the type of lasers, gas, liquid and solid state lasers and uh, the name of the laser which always comes from the active medium uh, and also has uh, some notation and uh, here in this uh, column I have the typical wavelength of the laser. So basically the type of laser defines unambiguously uh, the wavelengths that uh, the laser can uh, work at. And they come in different wavelength ranges, but these are something I've already pointed out. Excimer lasers work in the UV, that's the shortest wavelength that you find in this uh, table. CO2 laser that provides the laser light with uh, 10, nanometer, uh, 10 micrometer of wavelength. And you can find examples of uh, any range in between. Uh, these lasers can work in the continuous mode or in the pulse mode and you can see that the same laser working continuously or in pulse mode can provide you with different powers. This is of course average power and this is peak power. And when you go above uh, 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 uh, watts for the the power of the laser, this is where you can start using it for surgery. But uh, in ophthalmology, uh, you need a lower power of the system. But you can see that there are different uh, medical applications that you can use for uh, all these lasers. So, uh, last part of my talk, I don't have much. Uh, time. Uh, I just want to give you a few examples of why uh, lasers are used in medicine. What is the property that uh, makes them an ideal tool in, in medicine? Just to remind you what are the laser properties are monochromatic, coherence, uh, collimated beam, and very good focusability. So monochromaticity. It comes around when you want to use a very special, very uh, specific wavelength because you want to target certain constituents of material without targeting others. So for example, in uh, laser-assisted or uh, laser-based epilation, you want to target uh, the, uh, the hair roots, but you don't want to damage the tissue around. So if you would pick a ruby laser, then uh, hemoglobin, has a minimum absorption at this wavelength, whereas melanin, that's a continuous line, has uh, quite high absorbance. So for example, with a ruby laser, you can target melanin without affecting uh, hemoglobin. Another, another uh, application of the very narrow bandwidth of uh, laser light is when you use uh, Doppler probes to uh, have to, to map, uh, the, to map uh, perfusion into certain parts of the body because the way you do it is you take the laser line of a very specific given wavelength, you shine it onto the tissue and then since in, uh, in the, as the blood vessels move, the reflection of light reflected by these moving particles will be shifted in frequency and measuring how much and by how, by how much frequency shift and how much magnitude this light comes back from the surface, you can have a map of uh, perfusion of the area that uh, you are examining.
Gethsemane. Uh, I said that lasers can be uh, very high power. This is when you have uh, short pulses. High powers of laser can be used for stone fragmentation or cutting uh, as a laser light. Uh, and these are very advantageous, not just because they are high power, but also if you want to fragment a stone in an inner cavi inside cavity of the body, you can take the light down in an optical fiber and then apply the light to the stone in any internal organ without cutting up the patient, because uh, the light you can just take down in an optical fiber. Uh, also, cutting with a laser knife is very advantageous compared to the uh, ordinary knife because it's, it's a non-touch method, so there is less uh, risk of infection and also it can be very clean, there is uh, less damage uh, to the tissue. Monochromaticity of the laser and tunability can also be used for spectroscopic applications. So uh, you shine the light again onto the tissue, and depending on what uh, the reflected light, what the reflected light looks like, uh, you can tell uh, what type of tissue you have shown the light on. Uh, again, to do this, you need a very well defined frequency. So this is why lasers uh, are very advantages here. If you have a pulsed laser, you can actually make a distinction between different tissues by looking at how the light which, is, uh, which comes off the sample decays. So looking at the temporal evolution also carries some information. Coherence of the light is exploited in the laser spackle mechanism where you shine laser light onto, uh, onto the tissue and from the light reflected from different parts of the tissue, there is interference of the light and uh, looking at how much blurred this uh, interference pattern looks like, you can reduce the amount of speed each uh, constituent uh, carries. Uh, another example of using lasers in medicine is uh, surgery, refractive surgery of the eye. Uh, here, what they actually do now to perfection is they can actually shape your retina by uh, shaping the, the beam. It doesn't have to be constant intensity all across, but they can actually shape the beam having different intensities at different parts. Therefore, the amount of um, tissue evaporated uh, will be different at different parts, so they can actually shape uh, the uh, cornea, sorry, that's uh, you, They can shape, uh, shape the, uh, the cornea uh, to, uh, to make uh, the vision uh, as perfect as possible. Another thing is that uh, light is absorbed by different uh, parts of matter differently. So they can actually do surgery on your retina uh, by, uh, instead of cutting up, just uh, having the light go through the bulk of the eye and not absorbed. Uh, doing the surgery, the light absorbed only at, uh, at the retina uh, for different uh, diseases. And uh, another thing is that with lasers you have a very well controlled dosage that you deposit into the tissue. So you, if you have a, a, just by defining the time the irradiation is on, uh, you can uh, heat up different tissues to different uh, temperatures. Therefore, different effects can be uh, followed by the laser light irradiation. based on the uh, temperature rates. And with this, I would like to thank your uh, attention. Uh, I'm just uh, finishing with this photo of uh, what the <coughs> Eli infrastructure will look like. And all our lasers will be stationed in this dark gray building. The rest is just uh, offices and auxiliary buildings. But in this uh, dark gray building, we are going to have four laser systems, all pulse lasers of different uh, specifications, and we hope that maybe some of you will come back as researchers at this site. Thank you. 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 I was a bit longer than expected, but only six minutes.